What do Reservoir Dogs, Reality Bites, This Is Us, and The Way Home all have in common? Our featured guest today, Emmy-nominated music supervisor Jennifer Pikin. We discuss some of the most significant changes within the profession of music supervision, the most important relationships you need to be aware of when placing music into film and television, the most common misconceptions about the role of the music supervisors, as well as her masterclass she teaches for those wanting to become music supervisors. You don't want to miss it. Insiders. Are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Music Business Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we welcome Emmy-nominated music supervisor Jennifer Pikin. We discuss the changing nature of music supervision and sync in today's global media landscape, the biggest misconceptions about the role of music supervisors, and her wonderful new masterclass that she offers to those who are interested in learning how to become music supervisors as a profession. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back, insiders. On today's episode, we sit down with music supervisor Jennifer Pikin. You may know her from some of the films that she's done, such as Reality Bites, shows like This Is Us and All The Way Home. She's an Emmy-nominated music supervisor, and we had a really interesting conversation. We, We talked about a lot of very significant things. One of the things that I thought was most interesting was the significant shifts in the world of music supervision over the last decade as they relate to economics, as they relate to the cost of of songs, and as they relate to the volume of shows and movies that are out over the last 10 years versus the previous decade, where it was much more limited. Right, right. Yeah, now it's like there's so many opportunities for shows, and you know, which increases the opportunities for artists like you guys that are out there listening to get your music placed in film and TV. But one of the points that I loved, you know, and Jennifer's probably one of the the leading uh, music supervisors. She's been around for, for such a long time, and it was just great to finally meet her in person. One of the most things that I liked about this was the most common misconceptions about the role of the music supervisor. Yes. You know, yes. where it's just, you're just placing music into film and television and that's just not it. You know, there's a whole admin administrative side to it. and That's right. You know, it, most people, and also the thing that a lot of people have as another misconception regarding that topic, Eric, which is interesting, is everybody thinks they are the final, you know, end-all, be-all right. of, of decisions regarding songs. It depends. It dep- I mean, a lot of times in films, it's the director. In right. television, it's the executive producer. So, you know, music supervisors have told me over the years, as they've told you in our in these conversations, sometimes it's four and five different, you know, yeah, different decision makers that, that that'll green yeah. light this, yeah, or it's four or five different songs that they'll submit for a particular choice. Yes. So it's not like it's always their choice. That's one of one of the biggest ones too. So yeah, and I think talk to so many music supervisors over the years, whether it's on the on the show on YouTube or our uh, podcast here, where there's just so many different ways where these things come together. Sometimes the editor might have power and influence over it because they're putting together the pieces of of all the elements together. So yeah, and I and I thought one of the other uh, points about this was you know the most important relationships that you need to be aware of, you know, such as yes. the director and getting on with people at early beginnings of, of their career. Absolutely. You're, you're right on that, you know, and also the relationships are different depending on the medium. Right. You know, in commercials... You know, as we learned from, uh, from Josh talking with, with Josh Rabinowitz and Nick, right. it's the client, it's the producer. In some other cases, it's the music supervisor. Right. In movies, it's the director. Right. In television, it's the executive producer. It's not the director or the producer of the show. It's the showrunner. Showrunner, exactly. You know, who makes those decisions and who's the boss regarding those kinds of things. The other element that I thought was really interesting, in, and, and this goes to the, the previous point, Eric, about how music supervision has changed over the last 10 years especially, is how the global nature of film and television uh, has influenced her choices in in work. I mean, I you know we, we're going to talk about that in in the conversation. It was interesting because so many of the television shows go worldwide today. And I remember our conversation with with another music supervisor who was the you know um, Rampersan from Rampersad, yes from India from, from Netflix, Netflix in India, India, where he talked about the cultural distinctions in you know the whole 
region of right. Japanese and Indian and how you had to be aware of that regarding the, the sensibilities of the, of the show and exactly. the regions that you're in. Absolutely. So that was another very interesting one. Whereas I think in years past, we just made things or thought of them for the English speaking market. That was it. And with that insiders sit back, relax and enjoy our feature conversation with Jennifer Pikin. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rich. Thank you for doing it. We really appreciate it. Jennifer, I want to start out yes. with a sort of an overview question for you within your profession. Is music used today more to tell stories in film and TV than in the past? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've started over 20 years ago, and... Music was always sort of in the background. Occasionally you had a visual vocal. But now when I speak with the creators of the shows and the producers and directors I work with, it's so much more integral. It's a big part of it. It's part of the storytelling process. Um, I'm working on a show right now where I had a song written for the project. And it actually is being sung by several different characters in the show through the first season and the second season. Wow. So, big changes. Wow. Okay, great. Hi, Jennifer. This is Eric. It's such an honor to finally meet you because I've seen you so much in the music supervisor space, so it's great to finally meet you and literally bump into you five minutes ago. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, what have been the most significant shifts in the world of music supervision and sync over the last 10 years that you've seen? Uh, the ability to get music so quickly to your clients. So my clients are my producers, the studios, the networks, the um, editors. Uh, you just put a playlist together, bada bing, bada boom. It's in their inbox and they can cut it right in or the creators of the show can listen to it right away. So uh, technology has really helped me do my job. Okay. What would you say, Jen, are the most common misperceptions about the role of the music supervisor in your experience? I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> that I choose all the music and I'm in control and whatever <laughs> songs I give them are chosen for the specific scene, but it's not the case. Uh, sometimes it's scripted. The song is scripted for a specific scene and I'm in there to do the clearance on it. Um, if it doesn't clear, then maybe I come up for more options. Uh, on the other side, I will give them several choices for scenes, um, and we go back and forth, and, and the editor cuts them in, and we see what works, and sometimes it doesn't work, and we, we, it's a collaboration. I, th I think of my job, uh, I call it the three C's, creativity, which is coming up with ideas, uh, collaboration, so I'm collaborating with several different people, and clearance. So depending on what's happening, if the song can't get cleared, then I have to find another song, it's, it's always in flux. All right. That's a great way to put it. It's a perfect segue to the next question. Can you walk us through your process when selecting music for a project? You know, what are the main factors that are informing your choices? Well, first of all, no two projects are alike. Whether I'm working on a TV show, a webisode, a, sometimes I'm picking music for podcasts or film or advertising. So, first of all, I'm reading the script. That's the first thing I do. I'm meeting with the create the creatives, whether it's the director, producer. Um, TV's very producer driven, um, so my process is different. I kind of figure out what works for each project, but basically we kind of come up with a, an idea of what we think the project or sound of this TV show or series is going to be like. We start with that. You know, a lot of times it changes. So first it starts with, oh, we're going to use hip hop and it's going to be great and then we start editing and it's not working and so uh, you have to pivot so when I when I start a project I think it's going to be one way and inevitably it never is the way it's going to go and my favorite thing about music supervision is they oh there's not there's only going to be a, like one or two songs in the episode and I've been doing this for like so long and I get bamboozled every time I'm like great two songs in an episode this is going to be like a for me, very not a lot of music. Inevitably, there's like ten because <laughs> they forget about the background right. scenes and the mini mart, and maybe someone singing along. And so there's there's inevitably more music um, than expected. 
Right, and you're experienced enough to realize that that's coming when you I, hear, you know, oh, it's only two songs. Right, but no, but I I have up until fairly recently. I'm like, oh, real, I, I believed it. <laughs> right. Because you really you look at the script and you don't think there's that much music in there and you're talking to the creatives on it and then as it evolves and each episode or t- movie evolves, it's edited, things are cut in, things are cut out. So um, being a music supervisor, one of the biggest skills for a music supervisor is to be flexible and open-minded and curious. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to ask you, Jen, has the global nature of film and television influenced your work as a music supervisor with regards to your choices in terms of catering to diverse cultural audiences? Or is it project specific and it doesn't matter where it goes? That's such a great question. It's so interesting because I just made a, it's a spring, we're in the spring, spring's tomorrow, and I made a spring playlist just for myself and just to get in the spring mode. And I started listening to music and I, I put in um, a few, I just put in music from all over the world. I put in um, uh, an Indian artist, I put in um, a piece of music that's a French, one of the original French um, Jean-Michel, Car- I can't pronounce his last name, a French uh, experimental... Jean-Michel uh, Jarre? Yes, Jarre. 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 So yeah. You see, I was about to yeah. say that, and I wasn't <laughs> going to say it, I was going to say it wrong. From his 1978 album called Equinox. Right, so like, right. electronic, like, he was pre work. Mm. So, like, I just kind of... Uh, there's so much music out there, first of all. We have so much access to music. I mean, there's Spotify, there's iTunes... You go down the just rabbit hole. I go through my record collection, like looking back, what, oh, I pulled that out. Like, oh my gosh, I don't even remember when I got it. You know, it's like, it's just, so I kind, and I, and I, you know, some of my, because it's not specifically me choosing the music, but I can open up my creators of my shows and my producers and directors to music that they've never heard of before. And because they have so much access, I remember the point. I was in a meeting. And someone iPads had just come out. This is about I don't even know how long ago. Many, many years ago. And 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 they started searching on their iPad. I didn't have an iPad yet. I had my laptop with me. And so their ability to find music. And I think more and more people are open to to choosing music from all over the world. Now clearances is another story. It takes a little longer. Right. Okay, great. That's great to hear. I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, what are the most important relationships, and I think our audience would really love to know this, that people should be aware of who want to get their music placed into film and TV? Who do you think are the key, you know, players? Uh, I think there's the, obviously the, the music supervisors. You've got the sync agents who are pitching to the music supervisors. There's, um, it's all about relationships. It's going to these conferences. We're at Music Expo right now. Going to conferences and meeting people and building relationships. Now, to get through to music supervisors, it's very hard. My inbox every day is about 100 emails. If I just spent my day answering emails from all the different artists that send me music, and occasionally I do listen to them, and um, I do use them. It does happen. But you, you have to you know, hustle to get your music synced at this point because there's uh, I think I heard 100,000 songs each day are uploaded to Spotify, the DSMs so the um, people being able to create music now is so much easier you can create it in your home studio so everything's changed and because of the amount of music that's out there there's just no way I can know everything that's going on and um, so building relationships I think relationships, relationships, relationships you know and they they say location, location location and real estate I'll, relationships. I'll go with you. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things that you just sort of spurred this idea is that the volume, the volume of music that's out there. In the converse, also, as you well know, you've been at this a long time, the volume and oppor- volume of opportunities in terms of content of television shows and movies that is made today is 10 times what it was in, in the 90s and early 2000s. I think it might be even more than 10 times. M- much more than that. So my question to you is, do you think that there are more opportunities for independent artists and music to get into film and TV today? Absolutely. Unbelievable. When I started out, there's film TV advertising. 
I did one of the first video games. It was called National Lampoon's Blind Date. I, I went to the, so I was just trying to start out. I was starting out a music supervisor. I went to the game conferences. So now gaming is huge. Gaming is more placement in music and gaming, I think, than film and TV. It's, there's advertising. There's advertising on the internet. There's webisodes. There's podcasts, vodcasts. Um, the, all these things were not around. Trailers are huge. Yeah. For songs, it was always a big orchestral thing that you'd have these big orchestral things. Now there's trailerizations of music. There's covers of songs. So um, I would say so much more. And then there's the Hulus and the Amazons and the Netflix. So like I, I, my numbers not might not be quite right. I'm just kind of off the top of my head. But I remember speaking to, I have, an, I, I actually have an agent, and he was like, you know, a studio makes maybe 20 films a year, 10, 12 big films. Well, Netflix makes hundreds, and he, they make hundreds of films for each of their countries. So right there, the volume of just television is insane. Now, for music supervision, it's a little bit harder because we used to do 20, 24 episodes, and now you do like 10 episodes. But then there's more projects to do. So I, back in the day, I might only do two or three, and now I can do five. Or some music supervisors I've heard of doing up to 20. Wow. In different, they're in different phases, like pre-production, some are in production, some are in post. So, but there you go, 20 projects. Okay. I'm not doing that. Sticking with that subject that we've been talking about now about volume, has the volume of music available today affected the range of fees for sync? And does it vary for film, TV, trailers, and commercials? It's project. I, I'm going to go back to the same thing. I sound like a broken record. Project by project basis. Hmm. I actually worked on a Netflix show recently that had a tiny music budget. Um, it was a TV series, um, and but they wanted to hire me. They, they knew my previous work on a show called Workaholics and they were big fans of Workaholics. And so um, I didn't have a big budget on it. Thinking I think Netflix, it's a big studio, big money, blah, blah, blah. But then I did a, a Netflix film and I had an over a million dollar music budget. So I had this tiny, I don't even, like tiny, so it's all over the place. Um, and now I'm on a show where it's a music driven show and I don't have a big budget. So I'm constantly juggling using these songs. It, this, the show I'm on now, Time Travels. So we go back to 1999, 2007. We just used a Muse song in there. Very expensive nice. song. So I have to juggle my budget. And there's something that, uh, if you want to be a music supervisor, you always ask your, your uh, producers. It's a big tip. If you're working on a TV show, can you amortize your budget? Which is means you can use that budget more in one episode. So we knew this big episode was coming up, so we saved money to get this Muse song. And then we can use less in, in other episodes. So, or no music in episodes to pay for these bigger songs. So the answer is project by project. And, and, and but you know, I, I'll add on to that because production music libraries right now are so good and they're actually signing bands, real artists to them. They're not just library, uh, Muzaki. Uh, if I ever gave my producers that, they would cringe. Like, uh-oh, I don't want that. And now they're so good, and they've come up to speed. That helps with my budget. I always want to give independent artists more money, but when it comes down to it, I only have a certain amount of money, and I, can, I have to stay in budget. You know, so w w you had touched on this earlier with regards to the volume of shows. I'm curious, from your point of view as a music supervisor, has the volume in the last several years created more opportunities and jobs for you as a music supervisor? Um, they have, but I'm, I'm at a point in my career um, that I'm not, you know, I was doing five, ten shows at a time and doing a lot. I'm, I created a music supervision master course. I'm putting time into teaching uh, and mentoring and giving back because when I started, there was no courses in music supervision. Now there are, you can go to, you know, there are courses at colleges, but you know, I, I look at it as a democratization of it. Not everyone can go to college and not everyone can afford these uh, costs of going to USC or NYU. <laughs> and um, I was a UC uh, Santa Barbara graduate. I taught at UCLA Extension. And so for me, I'm, I'm segueing into doing less 
music supervision, even I love it, so I'm still doing it. I'm enjoying it, and I tend to be on shows that go on forever. I don't know, super grateful, I knock on wood somewhere, um, because I work on shows that go on for, for, for many, many seasons. So uh, it's a little transition for me. Okay. A little, I, I'm maybe not your typical music supervisor, but I have tons of music supervision friends. Right. And because of that, they're usually doing, you know, three to five shows because they have to make a living doing more shows because, like I said before, it used to be uh, 24, 20 episodes. Right. Week. So it's, it's, right. it's kind of a little, you know, it's harder because you have to do more shows. Okay. And you must be reading our mind with our questions. You must have seen our questions prior. Because <laughs> no, it, because, I didn't. Because it was I a, love not seeing questions. Because so it was a perfect... Because it makes me really think. Yeah, because it's a perfect segue. You know, you, you just touched on it, but you've created a master class for those wanting to learn the profession of music supervision. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's... Um, so I had some time when there were strikes and, and we had some downtime due to the pandemic. And um, I wasn't working at all. And... Um, I was just sitting there and I thought, I've always wanted to create my own class and I actually had the time. So I made my own, like, and since I know so much about production, being on so many sets and knowing, I just did, I shot a class that I always wanted. And I spent probably, if you look at my career, the first like six to eight years of my career coordinating and working for other music supervisors because there's no classes, there's nowhere to learn, there was nothing, there wasn't anything there was no YouTube there was nothing so I um you had to do it, do it with other supervisors right yeah. I had to learn from other music supervisors and they're sometimes really busy and you can't ask them that many questions because you, you're gonna drive them you're trying to get you know I did a lot of clearances um I had to get end title I did all the the work but once in a while they would throw me oh we're looking for this opening title for this movie and then my song would get picked you know, and I was like, it's kind of like, I don't know if any golfers are out there. When you, and I'm a terrible golfer. I, I, when you hit the ball and it just goes really well, and you're just like, wow. So I got the bug, and I spent a lot of time uh, helping other music. But I, I, lear- I, I really like, didn't know what I was doing. Cause I, I mean, until I got confident enough that I went out on my own. And I kind of got pushed out of the nest that way. It wasn't like I was, like, ready. Okay, and we'll we'll have you know info about how people can sign up in the in the notes and Great. everything for Thank you. for, for, yeah, for yeah. the course. Great. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the well, the next question was, you know, what are the best ways to gain experience for young professionals interested in music supervision as a career? Would you still say it's the same way to learn, like from people like yourself, and then to mentor with a music supervisor or to? Um, what, what ways you do you can, recommend? you yeah. know, it's really hard to get those internships right. out there. There's now internships at NBC, the, all, the, all the studios, all the record labels. Um, you know, when I first started out, I worked for like a, a, a producer. So I didn't even really, you know, I was just trying to get close to music, super, like music and film. It wasn't even a thing. I didn't even really know that's where I was going close to. But as I started, like, I did my first internship at a record label. Very first when I was in college. So that gave me the music button. But then I started, there were, soundtracks were big. So you, you kind of get as close as you can. Um, if, you're, if you have a friend that's making an independent film, try to music supervise their film. Take a course and try to learn as much as you can so that you're doing the paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork and clearance, a lot of legal things that you need to know about. You can't just go, oh, I'm picking my favorite songs and I'm going to put them in. So, um, I would do internships, film schools. Go to if you're in school or near a film school, go to the film the department where people are making films and, and offer your services, saying I love doing this. Maybe you should even be truthful. I don't really know, but I'm going to try to learn and get you the music and get your clearances done and, um, and 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 just put yourself close to it. You know, either they're in production at a record label, even if you're in promotion at a record, even if you're doing like an internship that maybe not with a music supervisor, you're just getting closer to it. I think is a great way to get your foot in the door. 
Two questions. One, are there any books or media that you can suggest to our audience that would be of benefit that you can recommend? Well, I know you, I'm pretty sure you had, you know, Amanda Creek Thomas. I yes. love her book. Thinking Thinks in it. Sync. Yeah. Thinking in Sync. I felt think this. Thinking in Sync. I recommend it all the time. I don't agree with everything in the book because I actually take submissions and that doesn't mean I'm going to get to them and listen to them, but I don't, uh, I'm, and I, I'm not so, uh, you know, the persnickety about like, oh, you know, dear Jennifer, people like, if you don't put my name on it, I'm like, you know what, if you write an email to me and it gets to me and I get to read it and I actually listen to it, sometimes I do, just time, it's all timing. So you do prefer people, you, people prefer, can reach out to they you? They can reach out to me. Or libraries are better for you, for them I, to go I, through? I prefer sync companies first. Got it. Because they know what they're doing. I don't have to spend the time step by step teaching you how to get a clearance done and then I'll say to you oh you wrote the song and they're oh well my friend was there and they wrote part of it and they don't really even understand mm. so do as much research on uh, your metadata is really important having all the information um, registered with a PRO ASCAP BMI um, there's a couple of new CSAC, ones CSAC GR, GR, G, GRM, GRM yeah. Global Music Rights right. GMR GMR yeah so there's a few um, so just have your ducks in order when you're pitching. You know, a lot of music supervisors love one stop, which means that you can uh, clear the song publishing and the master, which is the recording all in one. So when you're starting out, you know your fees aren't going to be as high. And be aware of that. So if you, I, I've had people come to me and they had their dad's lawyer call them and they all of a sudden their dad's lawyer was at an oil company and they wanted like $100,000. <laughs> And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> wow. Their dad's an agent, or you know, you never know. Right. Yeah. My my final question to you, Jennifer, is: Can you think of any examples where a sync placement had a really significant impact on an artist's career? Maybe it's something that you worked on that broke an artist. Okay, so I've had a, a bunch of those. I think I was one of the first people that licensed Jack Johnson back in the day. Wow. I think for Felicity. It was really interesting. I went back to license him when he started getting bigger on Alias, and they denied me the usage. Very interesting. You never know, right? And right. I was trying to explain to him I was one of those first usages. Um, but very recently, um, there's a girl named Abigail Lapel. Um, I got an email from someone, uh, her sync agent, and it was just timing. It just I opened it up. I'm working on a show in, in based in Toronto, and she said she was a Toronto-based singer. I there's no reason that I needed to use Toronto-based singers, and I just fell in love with her, and it was her first placement. And she, I think she won Folk Artist of the Year recently. Um, this is like in the last year. So check her out, Abigail Lapel. Absolutely, Amazing. we certainly will. Love indie artists, and, and, and she actually wrote me a little note thanking me. So it's sweet to, to actually hear from the artist. Because um, a lot of times I play songs from record labels, I never, I never barely even get a thank you. Right, wow. you, you, you never like hear next. anything. Everything's so <laughs> pop culture next. Next, exactly. Jennifer, we can't thank you enough for doing thank this. You. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Wow, what a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed that. You know, I, I loved how Jennifer talked about how the volume of music today has affected the fees. Yeah. This is something that I know we've spoken to other music supervisors for years over the now, year, yes. for years now about this issue. And of course, it's a larger cultural conversation within the culture of the music business is that the value of music has significantly changed. The whole rules and everything around what you charge, what what you're able to charge for something has dramatically changed given the volume and the accessibility and the ease at which music can be created. Yeah, and especially with independent musicians where they're just trying to get a break or trying to get their music in there. And that's kind of something that's spread within the culture that some music supervisors are against where they're trying to get money to the artist. But a lot of times it's just here's $500 and here's your song in the in the thing. And that's kind of something that's what well, we talked about, the value of the music. Prominent, has, the, yeah, the value of music. Value, has come, yeah. Yes. And so that's something that, you know, you and I and, you know, the guests that we've had over the years uh, have talked about. You know, one of the other things, too, that I, I found uh, really interesting was how she spoke about how the volume of content was creating more opportunities for the jobs of music supervisors. Which, yes. as we know, with all the channels and all the streaming and this menagerie of, of content that's coming at us, uh, where it has increased this idea that there's more opportunities for people that might be out there listening today that want to get into the world of music supervision. Absolutely. 
absolutely. It, it, it definitely has. I mean, you know, I, I, my company publishes the film and television music guide, and I can tell you we have expanded the amount of people who are in music supervision, who are working with brands, who are working with films, who are working with TV, who are working on video games, who are working in visual media and placing music into them. But to your point, which is an interesting one, is that, you know, the value component um, anytime you have, you know, a, a huge volume of something, the cost goes down. Right. In the era that, you know, we all came from in the past, there was relatively little content being made. And so therefore, you know, you could charge a lot more for it. Right. So, you know, that that's that's definitely something. The other element, Eric, that I thought was really interesting was how the rise of outlets and platforms has created more opportunities for more independent artists. This yes. is especially true. I continually see this whole concept that people are not going after established artists. They are much more willing to take on independent music. I don't think it's just on a, on a financial level. It's just because budgetary, it's right. budgetary. I think a lot of it is that people who are not signed independent artists are just have just as much ability to be creative, unique, talented as somebody and the quality of music that's coming out has has definitely gone the the bar has been raised now so i think people are start you know yeah. you and i have talked about this for years how if your songs are not broadcast quality ready to go right which, which there should be no excuse now in this day and age with home recording as good as it's gotten with the rise of uh, home recording right and the equipment and so i think what it is is that there's a lot of great stuff out there there's obviously a lot of bad stuff we've talked about that the glut of bad music out there but there is a lot lot of great music out there you just have to find it and i think what to your point rich that you're talking about is that a lot of these brands and other people that are in this world that are looking for music and curating uh, music for their outlets uh, they are going out and being more open to g getting an uh, independent artist and in some cases in a lot of cases breaking those artists that's right because there's an opportunity and an outlet for it and by the way eric i want to say this is also around the world right this is in latin america this is in europe this is in in the middle east you know, where, where sync and music placements are becoming much more prominent as well. Yeah. And, and one of the other things was uh, talking about her masterclass for those who want to learn yes. to become a music supervisor. It's interesting because, you know, I follow her on LinkedIn and she's been putting a lot of videos up lately. And I think they might be excerpts of the course, mm -hmm. but it looks something like it's really great. So hopefully we're going to have the link for that in the uh, description of the uh, video. So you guys that are might be interested in, in pursuing a career in music supervision uh, to check that out. It's a really in-depth thing. And, you know, Rich, I know you've you've talked about it as well, too. Absolutely. And, you know, she's one of the greats. I mean, Jennifer has been doing this for a very long time. And there's not many opportunities for people who want to learn that world yeah. to do so. And here you're having a chance to do it from, you know, from somebody who's had a lot of experience on the ground doing it. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top-rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes and our space. You can also find us at social media at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter X, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon, and be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Podcast.